Well, this morning I want to talk about the supreme pursuit. The supreme pursuit. What is the supreme pursuit? Well, you know, at, at New Year's, a lot of people make resolutions to pursue certain things, right? And maybe I'm going to pursue um, losing weight. That's one, one of the New Year's resolutions a lot of people make. I want to lose more weight or, or pursue better health. I'm going to, I'm going to exercise more and eat better and and be healthier, or I'm going to pursue more time with my family, or, or I'm going to read more, or I'm going to pursue a degree. Some people decide even later on in life to pursue a degree uh, in life, or maybe it's to pursue more, um, more travel. Some people say, you know what, I want to travel this year, and, and it's maybe, maybe it's to learn another language or to do something of that nature. There are a lot of different pursuits that people endeavor on, and, and oftentimes around New Year's, they start saying, as, as we think about New Year's resolutions, well, I think I'm going to try to do this for the new year. But I'd like to share with you just a simple passage, a very common passage. I know every one of you, I'm, gonna, I'm pretty positive, every one of you are well acquainted with this passage. But it gives to us a very simple and practical Christian philosophy of life. And it lays before us the supreme pursuit. Matthew chapter 6, if you have your Bibles. Matthew chapter 6. I'd like to read the whole context, and then we'll key in on the one verse that I want to key in on this morning. So we're going to look at verses 25, or read verses 25 through 34, but look specifically at verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, as we quiet our hearts now and begin to reflect upon your word, I pray that you would continue to guide us through your Holy Spirit as to what you intended uh, as, as you had your apostles uh, write the, the message that we have before us this morning, this, these words. We pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to apply them to our lives. And we pray that this new year that we're going to begin on here in just a few days uh, would be a new year that would be a new start for us and that this pursuit that we talk about this morning, this, this pursuit that you lay out before us in this particular passage would be uh, characteristic of each and every one of us, that we would each endeavor to pursue what is related to us here in this passage. And so, Father, just help us to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 6.33 is the key verse of this passage that I want to key in on that lays out before us that simple, simple and yet practical Christian philosophy of life. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, I've memorized this in the King James, and most of the verses I've memorized, I've memorized in the King James. So if, if, I, if I quote this to you a little bit different than what the NIV says, please be patient with me, uh, because I, I, I have memorized it. It's slightly different in the King James, although it's only the ending that changes. Instead of, instead of it saying, all these things will be given to you as well, it says, and all these things shall be added unto you. The meaning is exactly the same. The wording sounds a little different, and, I, and I, I'm... I tend, to, I tend to say those things that I've memorized. So just be patient with me if, if you see that and it appears to be a conflict. 
the very first word of verse 33 is a word that expresses contrast. It's a small little word. It's a little conjunction. But, B-U-T. But whenever you see that word but, just like whenever you see the word therefore, always look to see why it's there. It's illustrating or, or suggesting that there is some sort of contrast. You have this, but, now this. And the same is true in this particular passage. Uh, here he talks uh, in the verse just before this, verse 32, that this is the way that the pagans live, seeking after and running after food and clothing and, and the things of life. But the Christian is to live differently. In contrast to living the way that the pagan does, not only running after those things, but also worrying about those things, we're to live life differently. We're to be different than the pagans as Christians. And so he tells us, seek first, but seek first. And then he goes on and tells us what to seek. But the seek first phrase also illustrates to us that, that this is a priority. This is Jesus saying this, too. This isn't somebody else saying, you know, okay, as I look at life, I see a lot of things that are important. Uh, family's important. Work's important. Education is important. And out of those, I would say the number one spot is, well, that's my opinion. If I say that to you, right? You say, well, Pastor Dean, that's your opinion. I, I think this is more important than what you think is most important. But this is Jesus. So we can't really say, well, you know what, Jesus? I think I know a little better than you on this topic, <laughs> right? I mean, I guess you could. <laughs> I'd be afraid to do that, afraid to live life that way. Uh, I guess you could do that. But, but most of us recognize that Jesus knows a whole lot more about life, about the afterlife, about what God desires and what is right, what is wrong and everything. He's omniscient. We've talked about that in our study of, of the Gospel of John. And so when Jesus says, seek first, that conveys with it a whole lot of emphasis and priority. This is the number one thing to seek. Seek first. We are accustomed to dividing life into the spiritual and the material. But Jesus made no such division. In many of his parables, he made it clear that a right attitude toward wealth is a mark of true spirituality. The Pharisees were covetous and used religion to make money. If we have the true righteousness of Christ in our lives, then we will have a proper attitude about material wealth and the material world. Now, in balance to that, nowhere as well did Jesus ever magnify poverty or criticize the legitimate gaining of wealth. Jesus, Jesus never, never magnified poverty and made that the goal of every Christian's life. Now, he does talk about giving, but don't confuse those two. Uh, uh, and we'll talk about that as we go along. We, we, we are to give, and, and Christ talks a lot about giving and, and giving up and sacrifice and things of those nature. Uh, of that nature, but he doesn't emphasize poverty to be something that's sought after. God made all things, including food and clothing and precious metals and the abundance that the earth has, and God has declared that all things that he has made are good, and God knows what we need in order to live life in a, in a way that is good. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, he has given us all things to richly enjoy. Now, that's considering that they're used appropriately appropriately and in line with the teachings of the Word of God I know there's a group uh, um, it sounds funny but it, it's a really kind of sad that they distort the Word of God this way it's a, the Ethiopian Zion Coptic Church I don't know if you've ever heard of them I don't hear much about them anymore and I haven't looked to see how well they're doing I really hope they're not doing very well but the Ethiopian Zion Coptic Church believes that since God made marijuana, marijuana is good. And, and so they, have, they, use, he, they believe that Jesus smoked marijuana at the Last Supper. And so for their communion, they smoke marijuana. I, I'm not joking with you. I actually listened to one of our professors back in my Bible college deba days debate one of their, one of their religious leaders on, on one of the educational stations in South Florida. But that's not what Paul is saying here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 when he says that God has given us all things richly enjoyed. He's not talking about the, the abuse of those. Now, I suppose there, there could be a legitimate use for 
um, marijuana, right? We, we, we all recognize that medical usage of it, if it's strictly for medical usage and, and it doesn't have loopholes in the law, I mentioned that when, they, when the big debate was on, my opposition to it was the way the law was written. Um, but we have all sorts of painkillers that are derived from either synthetic formulas or, or natural uh, sources um, that people use. And the Bible allows for that. The Bible allows for that. Um, so, but that's not what, uh, uh, here, when he's talking about richly enjoying, it's talking about the appropriate use of the things around us. And so God has created a material world in which we live in. And so the material things of this world are not in and of themselves evil. It's the way that people use those things or how they seek after them or how they value them. In fact, really, when it comes to wealth, those are three things that the Bible teaches that we ought to remember. When you talk about the topic of wealth, it's how did you get it? The Bible has a lot to say about how one ought to get wealth. And basically, if you get it by honest, hard work, it's okay. If you get it through uh, crooked means, for example, in the Proverbs, you find a lot of things about um, unjust scales, unjust balances. You know, if you're putting your thumb on the balance to make it say something that it's not, that, that's what people would do is they would cheat that way. And, and so gaining wealth through deception, gaining wealth through fraud, gaining wealth through illegal means is condemned in the Bible. So how did you get it? How do you value it? How much value do you place on, the, on wealth? Because the Bible places very little value on wealth. If God happens to bless you with wealth, uh, then be happy and accept the blessings of God. But it ought not to be the supreme pursuit in life. And this verse helps us to understand that. That our supreme pursuit in life is not to be wealth and material things. Instead, it's to be the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes. Thirdly, when you talk about the topic of wealth, we need to remember it's what we do with it as well. In the Bible, when a person is blessed by God with wealth, and I think there's two ways that people can get wealth. One is through the blessings of God as we seek to do things right, whether it's working hard, working honestly or whatever, and God blessing that, or two, through the devil. And I say that because I believe that the devil's offer to Jesus was a legitimate offer. When he offered to Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth, I believe the devil could have done that. I believe that, that it provided God allows him, Satan can cause one to prosper. And, and there are many people in the world that, that are wicked that do prosper. What we have to remember is their prosperity is temporary, right? At two places in the Psalms, the psalmist questions the idea of the wicked prospering. Why do, David says in one place, why do the wicked prosper? And he struggled with that. And then he goes on to say, then considered I their end. And by that, he's talking about the judgment. They can prosper for a short time when you compare this life to eternity. Uh, but it's not going to be long. And, and so the, I think there's really two ways that people can gain wealth. One is through the blessings of God when we do things God's way, the right way. And the other is, is through Satan blessing that individual so that he will ensnare them and entrap them in the love of money and keep them from pursuing what is righteous. Proverbs 14.23 says, In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And, and so even the Bible gives us clues as to how one can gain wealth. So it's how did you get it, how much do you value it, and what do you do with it? Jesus warned against the sin of living for the things of this life. He pointed out the sad consequences of covetousness, which the Bible says is what? Idolatry. We say, I don't worship idols. Well, if we, if we allow money to call the shots in our life, if money is what directs us, then money has become your God. Money has become your idol because God is the one who's to direct the shots and tell us what to do. And, and, and he's done that in his word. Whether we obey him or not is the question. But if we allow money to take that place, then money has become an idol. That's why the Bible says that covetousness is idolatry. And it's the pagans that seek after those things that ought not to be the Christians. Jesus told us instead to lay up treasures in heaven. Now, what does it mean to lay up treasures in heaven? Basically, it means to use all that we have for the glory of God. And so when you get to that section in 1 Corinthians that talks about giving... What it says is when God, as a man sows, that shall he also reap, right? And as God blesses us, the purpose for his blessings is that we might be able to continue.
to give. Continue to sow. And so God blesses us sometimes with wealth so that we can bless others. That's the purpose for wealth, not to store it up for ourselves and so that we can amass some sort of fortune. Now, I, I do believe it's wise to plan for retirement. I, I'm not saying that. I, I think people ought to plan uh, to some degree or another for retirement. Um, but there's a difference between that and seeking to be wealthy. Um, you know, the ant. The ant is given as an example in the book of Proverbs as a creature that uh, prepares for the future. And so we need to prepare for the future. But there's a difference between preparing for the future and seeking to be rich. Now, where is that difference? As, uh, in everybody's mind, there's probably a little bit different line as to where that is. But again, what do you do with what you have oftentimes reveals how much you value what you have. And if we hang on to it too tightly, that may reveal what our true attitudes are in relationship to the things that God has blessed us with. Wealth enslaves people. The Bible teaches that. First of all, it enslaves the heart. God's Word often uses um, analogies in the Bible, and, and it talks about where your treasures are, there your what? Heart is as well. Um, we, when we begin to value it so much, it begins to enslave us, just like almost anything can. It not only enslaves the heart, but it also enslaves the mind. And it not only enslaves the mind, but it enslaves the will, so that it gets to the point that the person who seeks after wealth is almost like the addict that seeks after the next fix. And they're always looking for ways to make more money. You ever meet like someone like that? That it's always money. Money, money. How can I make more money? How can I make more money? How can I make more money? It's the topic that they talk about all the time. It's what they think about all the time. It's what they read about all the time. It's their life. How can I make more money? Now, sometimes you need to figure that out, right? Can't pay the bills. <laughs> the rent's due. I got to make more money. But there are other people that it's to amass a fortune for themselves and, and for various reasons. We don't even have to discuss all those reasons, but you're well aware of the various reasons that can cause people to become that way. And they become enslaved to it. Their will becomes enslaved to it. In fact, Paul, again, warns people about this in his epistle in 1 Timothy, where he says that those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a snare. So there's, there's a warning in Scripture. Wealth is not in and of itself wrong. But again, how did you get it? What do you do with it? And how much do you value it? And rather than making that the supreme pursuit of your life, this verse here in Matthew chapter 6 tells us that the supreme pursuit in our life ought to be the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when it is, everything else falls into place, including the topic of worry. By the way, are there rich people that worry? Do riches end your worry? It may end your worries about some things, but there, then you start worrying about other things. Like, how do I keep people from suing me and getting this? So I say, I think I'll set up an irrevocable trust and put everything in the irrevocable. No, 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 I'll set up an LLC because then there's some. And, and, and so even the wealthy are constantly trying to figure out what can I do to protect my wealth from somebody stealing it or taking it or defrauding me of it or et cetera, et cetera, right? It doesn't end worry in and of itself. It's, it's again, that value. How much of an emphasis do you put on that? And what are you really seeking after? What really makes you tick what is really your passion in life is it verse 33 seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness now what is seeking the kingdom what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God I'm, I'm just going to make a real simple definition on seeking first the kingdom of God and that is basically living for what God wants to bring about living for what God wants to bring about we say, well, how do I know that? You've got to be in this book, right? It's here. It's revealed to us. What God wants for us as individuals is revealed in his word. There's no question mark about it. It's not something mystical. Uh, you know, we don't have to go up on the top of a hill and stay there for three days fasting and, and chanting and hoping that God will reveal to us his will. He has revealed his will to us. We just need to open it up and study it. It's here. It's here before us. 
I know there's that subjective will of God regarding certain choices that we have to make in life uh, that we may have to uh, certainly, certainly have to pray about. But for the most part, God's objective will is clearly revealed to us in, in his word. And so am I living life pursuing what God desires? Am I seeking to bring about what God wants brought about in the world around us? And the Lord's Prayer reveals that same kind of attitude when we're told to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How's that going to happen? That happens as we live to help bring about God's will here on earth. Whether that's witnessing, whether that's living righteously, no matter how the world around us lives, whether that's working honestly and working in a way that brings glory to God. Everything we, that we do, I mentioned before, that, that we make this artificial distinction between the sacred and the secular. And really, the Bible doesn't do that. When you go to work, it's not like you're, you're, you're out of the Christian environment now. Although some people do have that, that di dichotomy, that artificial dichotomy that they shouldn't have. And they come to church and they act one way because they're in a holy place or however they think about it. That's the way I thought as a kid. I used to think, you know, when you go into the church, you're in a holy place. Right? My idea of the church was more like the Old Testament idea of the tabernacle. I, I had some incorrect con concepts about the church. Now, it is, it is holy in, the, in the, the true sense of that word in that we've reserved this for the worship of God. That the sanctuary is set apart that the church facilities are set apart for the teaching of the Word of God and instruction in the Word of God and the worship of God. It's holy in that sense. But we think of it as like, when I come into this place, at least I used to, and, and I think a lot of people in the world around us, when I come into this place, I have to behave a certain way. So I, I can't cuss in church. But when I get out of church, then I can cuss. Have you ever met Christians that do that? I, I have. I have met Christians that behave a certain way in church, and then when they get out of church, they behave a, a, another way. In fact, I'm, I'm surprised at how language has degraded over the years, even, even in many Christians' vocabularies, and how it's justified sometimes. Well, this is, you know, everybody's saying, everybody's using it now, and before long, it'll be a common word. And it really bothers me when I, when I hear people that just acquiesce to the culture's language. Um, I still think we ought to be different, even in that area. Not, not condescending, not arrogant or prideful, not, not hypocritically righteous, but that we don't have to talk that way. We, you know, the Bible says um, you know, that uh, we shouldn't, shouldn't have any filthy conversation. That there shouldn't be any filthy jesting. Sometimes I hear some Christians passing along, they hear a, a joke that's not, not a nice joke, but it's funny. And they tell you the joke. And, the, and the, you know, the bad thing is sometimes you even laugh at it, right? <laughs> whoa, and, and then, whoa, you got to stop. Is that, that's inappropriate. Uh, so we, we have to be careful about that. But living, living for what God wants to bring about in the world around us, is that what we're really seeking for first? That's our, that's our supreme pursuit. Seek first the kingdom of God. Not seek first wealth, not seek first riches, not seek first education, not seek first prestige, not seek first power or influence or any of the other things that so many people in the world around us seek, but seek first the kingdom of God. And then it goes on and says, and his righteousness. Now these two things really are linked, and yet they are distinct. The kingdom of God has to do with everything, I think, that, that belongs to God and that God desires to bring about in the world around us. His righteousness, I believe, here is a def definite reference to the character of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, we're told to be imitators. In I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, we're told to be imitators of God. Now, I can't imitate his omniscience. I can't be everywhere at once. Well, I'm pretty fast, but no, I can't, I can't, I can't be, I'm not, I used to be, I would, boy, oh boy, man, you know, our bodies deteriorate fast, I got, I got a sore hand here, this is bruised and swollen a little bit, I went into the, to shave this morning when I got up, I look in the mirror and I, I got a bruise right here, yeah. you know what I was doing yesterday, well, those guys should know this, when you get a bruise right here and you got a bruise on your finger and on your hand, yeah, I got so we had a blast. We shot for about three hours yesterday. Wasted all my Christmas money on ammo. But, but you know, you got to practice sometimes, right? 
and uh, we, we, we had a great time shooting, but we, th- there was this old school bus where we were that we were shooting through, and um, it really makes you realize how fake the movies are when, you know, the police hide behind the door. Uh, every rifle we had with us, every rifle, the AKs, the, the AR-15s, the 270 Winchester, every rifle we had went all the way through that bus. And the, I think the bus metal is probably a little tougher than some of the, the cars are. I mean, all the way through it, pew, pew, and the exit, the exit holes of the, on the other side of the bus were bigger than the entrance hole. Anyways, we're having a blast shooting shotguns and everything. At, at, at the, but so we would go up into the bus, and we'd look to see, okay, came in this side, went out that side, look out the way, and, and I, I jumped. I forgot about my back. And, I, you know, I walked to the back of the bus, and I looked, and I, and I sort of pew, took that little jump down. And, oh, oh, hey, I'm okay. And I walked away, so I, we climbed a little while later, I, I, but I thought, okay, that was a little stupid, i got to be careful. A little while later, climb up in the bus and, and, and did the same thing. At this time, I felt it. Now, fortunately, God, God has been gracious to me, and I'm doing okay. I was really afraid that today I was going to be in a lot of pain, uh, but I'm doing pretty good. So God, God was gracious, because, what, just two years ago, I was wearing a brace, and they were talking about surgery and everything else, and, and so I, I, I praise the Lord, but I'm quickly realizing how fast um, my body is failing. And, and so I, I'm not fast. <laughs> I can't be everywhere. I can never imitate, and we know that. It's even silly to think about imitating the attributes of God. But we are to imitate the character of God. There's a difference. Attributes are things like omniscience and uh, being omnipotent, all-powerful, those type of things. Character is, is the holiness that we're to possess as, as believers, being righteous like God, um, uh, valuing good and not evil, uh, seeking after good and not evil, being merciful, being forgiving, all of those things that we see that were true of God in the Scripture and that are true of the Son of God in Scripture are the things that we're to seek after in life. Do we really value being Christ-like more than making money? Do we really value being honest, being holy, being merciful, being good, being kind, being reverent, being pure, being, being all of the things that the Bible tells us to be? Do we really value that more than making money? More than our occupation, more than wealth, more than possession, more than things. Seek first the kingdom of God, the things that God wants to bring about, and his righteousness. And then it goes on and it says, and all these things will be added to you. That's King James Version. All these things will be added to you. Now that doesn't imply, I don't think that's a, uh, that should not be a proof text for the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel preachers, but it is, unfortunately. There are people that are real good at distorting this and making it out that if you do this, if you do this, then God is going to make you rich. He, he doesn't say he's going to make you rich. He says what he's going to do is take care of you. Just like he takes care of the birds and just like he takes care of the flowers. How many rich birds have you met? Right. <laughs> right. That every day they're searching for food. Every day they're searching. By the way, some people also misuse this verse in that they think that all I have to do is if I live for God, if I live for God, I really don't have to work, and God will drop everything into my lap. Does a bird have to leave its nest to get its food? Yeah. Does it have to hunt? Does it have to look? Does it have to search? Yes. Does it have to go to the ground and pull that worm out? <laughs> or get that little bunny rabbit? Or I wish some of them would get those stray cats in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Guy, unfortunately, the guy at the end of the street was evicted, and I don't know if it's true or not. One of the neighbors said he had 50 cats in his house, and um, he, since he was evicted, uh, he left all of them behind. And you go by, they're out. I haven't seen 50 yet, but I counted 13 in the front yard the, the yesterday, just 13 cats there. And um, I think I'm going to call the I don't know if the county, somebody told me the county won't pick them up unless you put them in some sort of cage. or ha- I don't know what the rules are on that, but... Um, we could use a few good hawks in our neighborhood. Or, I don't know. Do they eat cats? My wife said give them to the Chinese restaurant. But I, I'm not. I'm, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> she really did say that. <laughs> I said, said, I eat there. I don't want to give them to the Chinese restaurant. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But, 
Yeah, it's not, it's not a proof text for be, becoming wealthy, that if I live the way that God... However, God, again, does say that if, if we sow, then we will reap in accordance to how we sow. But we, we reap uh, in, in a way so that we can sow again. Not so that we can amass it for our own pleasures or our own pursuit. Now, again, sometimes, you know, okay, somebody said, Pastor Dean, you are out shooting guns. You got a gun? Why do you need a gun for? Strictly self-defense. That's it. No. <laughs> I enjoy shooting sometimes. Is it wrong to have something like a gun or a, a, a motorcycle or, or a bicycle, um, you know, or something that you find uh, a jet ski? No, I don't, I don't think those things are wrong. It's when you begin to amass. I, I think that's the whole idea that the scripture can. It's when you begin to live for those things. It's when you skip church to go shooting. Okay. Or fishing. Or hunting. Or, let's see, what else can I think of? No, jet skiing. Disney. Uh, no. What, what is it? What really, t- you know, and I can't, obviously. Okay, if you miss church to go to Disney, I'm not going to connect. But, however, what floats your boat? And only you can answer that. And only you can honestly answer that. What really ignites your passion? You know, if somebody calls you on a Sunday morning and says, hey, I'm going shooting, and you have the choice between church and shooting, and there's really no real reason why you can't go shooting maybe some other time, do you choose to, to skip church to go shooting? Because to you, shooting is much, you, you'd much rather go shooting than go to church. If that's the case, then I think something's wrong. Something's wrong spiritually. You say, well, I don't have to go to church. Where in the Bible? Well, the Bible does say, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Does it say how many times that, we, that is? No, it doesn't. But if you, if you love something more than you love being with God's people and being in a place where you're worshiping corporately and where you're seeking to exercise your gifts, hopefully exercise your gifts to encourage one another daily, as the Bible tells us to do, then I think something's spiritually out of kilter. If, that, if those other things become your passion, you know what I'm saying? If you, if you live to go fishing and hunting rather than living to see the will of God come about in the world around us. And, and that, that may be somebody. I hope it doesn't. I hope that's not true of any of us here. But if it does, it may, maybe it'll be the impetus that will cause you to take, a, take and reflect on that. How, how am I valuing the things of this world in comparison to the things of God? Because we need to do that sometimes. We need to take inventory. And ask, do I really care more about what God desires to come about, or do I care more about what I desire? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll take care of the rest. Someone might say, well, boy, he didn't do a good job with the apostles. I've heard that before. Didn't the apostles seek first the kingdom of God? Didn't they really, if anybody lived for God, wasn't it the apostles? Yet they're beaten all the time. Read through the book of Acts. They get beaten. Paul says, I know what it's like to be hungry. Well, he also said, I know what it is to abound. And Paul didn't die die of starvation. Right? God didn't say you're going to get three meals a day. Who says you've got to have three meals a day? I mean, really, we eat three meals a day. Many of us could eat a lot less than that or smaller three meals a day. <laughs> but we eat three meals a day. Who says you have to? Have? God will supply the food for you. I, I remember going to Bible college, and, and there were times I didn't have money to pray. And I've told you this before, but it's, it's so vivid to me. And God confirmed. It, there are those objective reasons why I believe in God. And I have a lot of objective reasons. We can talk about fulfilled prophecies. We can talk about the archaeological confirmation of the scriptures. We can talk about just the truth of the nature of man and it's revealed in the scriptures. We can talk about objective evidences for the existence of God. I have a lot of objective reasons for why I believe in God. But I have a lot of subjective reasons as well. And a lot of those has to do with answered prayer and seeing God take care of me the way that he says he'll take care of us in scripture. And when I was going to Bible college, I was broke. I didn't have money. to. Nobody paid my way through Bible college. They weren't eligible for the Pell Grants or federal aid. And so I had to work a job to pay my way through college. And when I, when I went through college, I saved up enough money. to I paid off my college bill by, before I graduated. I saved up enough money to go on a honeymoon. I paid off my car. I was making car payments while I was in school. And I had money in the bank. How many college students graduate that with no Pell Grant and no federal aid? I worked hard. 
I worked so hard that there were times I couldn't climb the stairs at the Carillon Inn on Miami Beach that we cleaned that night because I'd work during the day at Kmart in the garage. I'd get off work and I'd go to work at night, come home, sleep for about two hours, get up and go to work. And at the end of the summer, I could barely walk up the stairs. But God enabled me to be able to do that so that he could provide for me. I wasn't rich when I graduated from college, but I was a lot better off than a lot of people were when they graduated from college. And God continually met my needs through better jobs, better pay, things of that nature. But I still had to leave the nest. I still had to get out of the nest. I just didn't say, stay in the nest and say, okay, God, you say this, drop it in my mouth. And I've seen people live life that way. It's out of balance with the teaching of Scripture. God does provide. He may not provide in exactly the way that we think he ought to provide, but he will provide in exactly the right way. He always does. When we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is your supreme pursuit in life? Is it this? Is it the supreme pursuit to the degree it ought to be in life? We have a new chance at a new beginning in a sense with the new year. You know, every year I have those things I regret. Probably like most of us. We were, the other night we were over with some friends after Christmas Eve and we are talking about our kids and the way we raised our kids and I think to myself, you know, if I could go back, I'd do a few things differently. Can't go back though. I think my kids would have liked to be able to go back too. <laughs> yeah, dad, we agree. <laughs> but uh, you can't do that. However, you can change the future. We can change now and live differently into the future. And so... I hope that this verse will be your guiding philosophy in life. It'll be your supreme pursuit. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Can you say that with me as we close? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I know that all of us have read this verse before. We we all recognize its importance and we're all familiar with it and yet it's a constant struggle because of the battles of the flesh the temptations of the world to keep this as our supreme pursuit and so father i i pray that you would help us as we begin 2016 to make this our our supreme passion our supreme pursuit in life to seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and then to trust you to take care of us in the process. And so, Father, uh, help us to remember this throughout the year and throughout our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name.